know that song, right? Never Gonna Give You Up was one of the biggest pop songs of the 1980s. It hit number one in 25 countries. The person who probably knows that song the best is sitting across from me right now, and I'm so delighted he was smiling while we were during play, while we were playing that. I was a little bit terrified. Rick Astley is back in North America. 30 years after that first single uh, of his uh, became a huge hit, launched his career. He's about to kick off a tour with two sold-out shows in Toronto and Montreal this week. Right now, he joins me here in our Q studio. I'm yeah, I'm so happy you were smiling during that. <laughs> Why well, do you have people who kind of like go into like hissy fits sometimes when you play their old tunes? Or... I, I well, you know, yeah, yeah. Sometimes okay. <laughs> you get people not that they get you get hissy fits, but you can tell they don't like it. Yeah, okay, okay. You, no, you know I, what I, mean? I, I've learned to embrace that song. It's been good to me. I've had some amazing things happen to me because of that song. So I've kind of gone full circle with it, I think. There's probably a time, probably a time at the end of the 80s, maybe beginning of the 90s, where I was thinking of, you know, giving it all up anyway. Yeah. And then I was kind of thinking, if I don't hear that again for a while, that'll be okay. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But <laughs> yeah. it's come full circle, I think. Yeah, Radiohead wrote a song about that. They have this song called My Iron Lung that <laughs> right. they, wrote about, they wrote about Creep, right? That's going right. to keep them... Yeah, but it's funny. I mean, I could, listen, I can totally understand why a band like that could have certain... Uh, thoughts, let's say, of a song like Creep because it became an anthem. Yeah. And I think, you know, from guys doing it on an acoustic in a pub, mm -hmm. uh, you know, right the way through to every covers band in the world doing it. And you know what I mean? It's one of those songs, you know. Mm -hmm. But I I can kind of understand it, but I also see the other side of that, and that is that, well, isn't that why we write songs? Isn't that why you sing songs? Is to kind of get people to listen to them, you know what I mean? That so, sounds like, it sounds to me like you've given a lot of thought to this. this well, is, this I've is had to, that, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. It comes <laughs> up in most interviews. Um, uh, but like I say, it's been really good to me as well, and I can't, I can't really deny that. You know what I mean? I can't, I can't sort of. So I don't know. And like I say, I, I I've come round with it because I I quit for a long time. You know, I didn't sing that song for fifteen yeah. years or whatever it was. So um, I can do it with a smile on my face now and see see a bit of irony in it as well. I'm fifty two. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. Yeah. There's no sense being crooked about these things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, well, I want to get to another song. This was a big number one, number one in Canada in the late eighties. Take a listen to this. Song that it's, from 1987. It's, it's actually the same song backwards, by the way. Just you know, but, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a real Beatles trick. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you play it, if you play that forward, you get like a satanic verse mm. or something like that. Mm. I feel like you were big in bigger in Canada than other places. I feel like Canada um, was, was I, good I, to you. I was saying to somebody recently, actually, that very often um, certain territories, as they were called back then, I don't know whether it's, they use the same thing terminology, but would release a different single because by the time the UK had got over one single or what have you. It might be a year later or eight months later or what have you. And America definitely did. They had a song called Strong Strong Man as a single. But I think Canada just released them all. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah so, <laughs> we were, we, so just played, we played your whole tape top yeah, to bottom yeah, exactly, every day. Yeah, yeah. so um, I, went, I went to the Philippines for the first time uh, a few years ago now. and But I hadn't been there back in the day, if you know what I mean. And it was just nuts because they kind of knew every song. I mean, I'm like, I'm thinking, all right, we're going to have to play third track from album two or whatever, three now or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd all just sing along with it, knew every word and everything. And then I was talking to somebody afterwards, and he kind of said, yeah, I think we just kind of put them all out, to be honest. That's you know? always good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, my, my buddy Jim Cuddy, he's in this great Canadian band, Blue Rodeo, he says, mm -hmm. I can always tell when the audience doesn't want to hear a certain song because they start applauding before it's over. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, the last 10 <clears throat> seconds, they're already applauding. Wow, okay. Yeah. Oh, I'll have to remember that. Yeah, okay. keep, keep yeah, that in yeah. mind. What's yeah. it like, by the way? What's it like, uh, just as a person, to be in, in in the middle of all that fame in the '80s? Do you reflect on it now? Um, I do reflect on it a little bit, in the sense that when I look at certain artists who are around today and what they are going through, because of you know we've got the internet now, it's a different ball game, really. When you look at somebody, let's even say you know, let's say Justin Bieber, for want of a yeah. better one, you know, yeah. um, 
you just think, what has his day been like when he's been at his most kind of, you know what I mean? Yeah. And because there's no escaping that. There's no escaping. Did it feel it. like that for you? Well, like I say, I don't think it, I don't think it was quite as as intense then. It was pretty intense. Don't get me wrong, but not everybody had a video, you know, in in their phone, in their pocket, in their, you know what I mean? So yeah. everything you do, I've I've been in in men's rooms. And guys just take out the camera to take a photograph and you go, whoa, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. I'm actually taking a leak right now. What are you doing? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But it's a natural thing for somebody to see someone and go, oh, my God, that's what's his name or what's her name? Mm -hmm. And just to take the phone out. And and you, and you so I don't know, really. I, th I think when I think back to what I had, I think it was probably small potatoes, really. So you're happy it happened to you when it did? Yeah. And also I think that there's a lot of things that were pretty amazing about the 80s i think um you still sold records people valued the physicality of owning music in that way and i think i'm not i don't want to be a dinosaur and kind of say i'm i'm still in that because i'm not i think it's great that you can listen to anything any time of the day wherever you are fingertips there it is but i think the thing of actually owning especially a vinyl because you had to literally look after it mm -hmm. if you didn't look after it you couldn't play it anymore you mm -hmm. know what i mean mm -hmm. um and i think that's I still think fans are as devoted as they've ever been, but I just think the tactile nature of owning, or even even a, ca a cassette, which were horrible on the one end, but you had to look after them or else they wouldn't play. And so I think you, the ownership of it felt slightly different. Yeah, there was a certain preciousness, I know what mm. you mean. Uh, well, why did you give it up? You mentioned you gave it up. I just had enough, really. Uh, I crammed quite a bit into four or five years, uh, and it was a bit nuts, to be fair. I mean, I think if you're doing, you know, proper pop music, you know, it's it, it's not the same as being like with four or five people in a touring band, it was about doing videos and interviews and doing being on TV. Being yeah. on TV was more important than doing a gig right. if you're a pop artist in the way that I was. So by the time I actually got around to do some shows, I think the record company were all kind of saying, that's great, just get him out of those places and get him on the TV again, you know. Um, and I think that I kind of came around to the fact that it, you've, you don't really feel that human, I don't think doing that day in, day out. It's not a very human... Don't get me wrong, I can chat No, no, I know what you mean. You feel like a bit of a commodity, though. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I'm, I'm aware that this is <clears throat> yeah. a, this, there's an exchange happening yeah. here. You no, know, but I understand. It's, it's, We're not in a pub right now, well, you know? Well, to be honest, I only arrived last night, so it's fine. Do you know what I mean? But if, you, if, <laughs> if, if you've done a week of solid interviews, yeah. I think there is a part of your brain that turns to just mush, I think. Yeah. And I think then you... And also, it's not that related to music sometimes. I mean, what, what's amazing about the room we're in right now is there are instruments in it. Yeah, it's There's Glenn, a lovely piano there. Glenn Gould's piano. So I've been told, actually, yeah. yeah there's a nice guitar there. There's mm -hmm. a little mandolin, I think mm -hmm. it is there. Yeah. Great drum kit. So it's kind of, you know, there's even a Vox A30 in the corner that amplifier mm -hmm. there. And you kind of think, oh, yeah, music. That's what I do. I do music. Right. And sometimes, especially on some of the TV shows, which... And listen, it's great you can get on the TV with music these days because there's not a lot of space for it anymore. Mm -hmm. Um... But it's it's you suddenly realise you're part of a TV show. It's not about music. It's a, it's just a section. Yeah. And sometimes you have to remind yourself, what do you do? Oh, I make music. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. So it's like music cult. I think about it this way. I think that sometimes music is different than music culture. Right. You know what I mean? Like I had I was reading one time in this article, and a guy said, I really like the Dave Matthews Band until mm -hmm. I went to the university and found out I wasn't allowed to like the Dave Matthews Band. All oh, right. And I thought to myself, why not? And he said, Oh, it's because there's a difference between music that I like. And I like the way this sounds. Right. And music culture, which dictates that okay. I'm not allowed to. Okay, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, that's always been there and will never go away because mm -hmm. it is, uh, f to, to say it's fashion related, fashion isn't the right word, actually. I can't think, of, maybe music culture is a better way of putting it, but it is very much what your peers and the people around you are into. And unless you're very strong, it's very hard not to go with the flow a little bit. Right. Because if that ticket's the ticket to get this week in town because that band's coming, if you if you don't uh, if you're strong enough to say well I don't care I don't like them then good on you, but I think most people do like to sort of feel part of something part of a crowd. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, I, on that point, I want to I want to play the big hit uh, just one more time here because I want to ask you another question about it. So that's Rick Astley. That's never going to give you up. People like I I, I, I wasn't around when that when that song first right. came out. Um, I, like so many people, have done the whole, you know, you click on a link mm, that's going to be for, you know, you got to read this article from the Sunday Times, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and then you click on it and then Never Going to Give You Up starts yeah, playing. Yeah. They call it Rick Rolling. Oh, yeah. How do you feel about it? Um, it's been good to me. Uh, that song, I think I said before, that song in general yeah. has been good to me. Yeah, but this is a whole different way. I've never well, it is, this is, it is, but thing. it also has been pretty weird in the sense that... Um, 
I'm not saying I can play to a young audience now because of that. Of course I can't. But I've done certain festivals, certainly in the UK. We did one in Japan recently, actually, um, where it's quite an eclectic mix because someone like me is on it as well. For instance, we played in Japan uh, last August. Foo Fighters were headlined. Yeah. And I got to play on that festival. Yeah. And I'm not saying that's just because of Rick Rowling. We have that clip. Can we just play that clip, Mitch? Ladies and gentlemen, ah, <laughs> would you please welcome our new best friend, Rick Astley, right now. <laughs> That's like a smells like teen spirit. Yeah, that was nuts. Um, but you seem to be like, I should say, like you, you seem pleased with it. Oh, yeah, you know what I am? Because I think, I, I mean, I, th I can understand, again, going back to the thing you said about Creep and Radiohead, I can understand certain bands would be horrified if their song was used in something like the Rick Rolling thing. Yeah. But I'm not perhaps as attached to what that song means to certain people as to others, i.e. somebody from my generation, if somebody says to me, that was our wedding song, then that really means something because I'm 52 and I'm married. Mm -hmm. I get it. I mm -hmm. get what that means. We've got our song, my wife and I. Um, but using it in a Rick Roll is just a bit of fun. It's not, or, or, or it's a pain in the ass, depending on which yeah, way you look yeah, at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm not, I, I can totally understand that it's not, it's not a big deal. Do you know what I mean? It could have been anybody's song. It just happened to be that because either whoever started it thought it was, you know, the video was cheesy enough or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, have you been Rick Rolled? I, I was Rickrolled right in the beginning by a friend who lives in America, and, and I, I I had no idea what he was doing. And also YouTube, to be fair, I don't know how long YouTube's been around, but Rick Rollins has been around, I guess, eight, nine, ten years, something like that. Mm -hmm. So YouTube was there, but it, it hadn't sort of taken over as the go-to thing to go and see a video of anything that's ever been recorded. So I didn't really grasp what was going on anyway. The idea of sending somebody a link that was actually a video link was still in its infancy, I think. You yeah, know? it was still pretty new. So I had no idea what he was doing. In the end, I actually called him and said, look, what the hell are you, you know? I want to play this interview for every band who comes in and rolls their eyes whenever we talk about their hit, you know? Right, I really okay. do. I like okay. it. This, this is what, it's, this is what okay. it sounds like to be at peace with something like that. I want to play uh, some new Rick Astley right now. Take a listen to this. Sometimes I just don't feel like waking up Want to stay inside my dreams Sometimes I feel like I am breaking up do you know just how that feels? Hope is for the hopeful. That's Angels on My Side from Rick Astley's album 50. It came out in 2016. So we just talked a little bit about that. You gave it up. And I think it would be safe to assume, and not for someone like you, but it, you just, there, there are people in your situation who would quit music and then get this Rickroll thing happening and then just, you know, tour around casinos playing yeah, it yeah. and give you up. But you're still making new music. What brought you back? Um, I was going to be 50, obviously, a couple of years back, and I kind of felt, well, it's either buying a Harley and riding across America um, yeah. or doing something, you know, whatever, that's like a... <laughs> so this is a midlife a bit, crisis? A little bit, yeah. yeah. And um, <laughs> so and I have a little setup in my in my garage at home. It's, I call it a garage. It's not really a garage, but it, it, whatever. And, and I just started making some music because I've been gigging again for, let's say, 10 years, roughly that. Uh, not, not co that's just coincidental with the Rick Rollin. It's not because of Rick Rollin. I just, <laughs> I just kind of started gigging again. Anyway, um, and I think the thing, social media now, people will let you know what what they like, what they don't like, and if they want a new record, they'll they'll just keep saying it. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you start to think because I think there's an element of needing a bit of courage to want to make a new record when you when you're approaching fifty and you haven't made one for a long time. Um, so I don't mean that it's not like real courage, but I just mean like to actually say, right, I'm going to do this. Yeah, yeah, and I'm going to. People know me from a certain thing. I'm going yeah. to. I'm going to put out something new. That's, yeah, yeah. And um, and I made the record at home. I actually I, I did it all. I literally, you know, played all the instruments, produced it, did everything. And and in that way, I really felt good about that because that was me saying, this is what I'm capable of at the age of fifty. Yeah. And I'm not expecting a lot from it, but I did it for me and for some of the fans who you know, genuine fans who, who, you know, go to the gigs, you know, get off their ass and actually go to the gigs. Mm -hmm. And um, and they were very complimentary in the sense of, like, we'd like to hear some new music. We, we love your old stuff, and mm -hmm. it's great that you come and do that. Mm -hmm. Make a new record. And eventually you believed them, like I say. And, and so so I did it. And uh, all my friends, some of which are, you know, professional songwriters, producers, and, all, and work with big bands and all the rest of it, Kind of said, you know what? It's actually pretty good. You should yeah. actually do something. Well, it did it's really like, well. It did well on the charts. We, the we had a number one album, a number one platinum album in the UK. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, it's not about a chart position. I know it's not, but it, it's all, it's nice. Yeah, I'll be blunt. It's really, really nice yeah. because it's not like, hey, you got to number thirty-eight. It's like you had a number one album. Yeah. It's ridiculous, and the names around me was ridiculous. Yeah, like like the megastars of today. Yeah, the Adele's. And 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 yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm all right. Fair enough. Their albums have been out for three and a half years or whatever, <laughs> and still in there. Um, no, but just just to to be able to put your name against somebody else's and say somebody very well may have bought your record or their record today mm -hmm. that's pretty weird I think that, that was something I wasn't ever going to expect to happen again so. again I, I want to play this interview for every artist that, that, come, <laughs> that comes in here Rick Astley thank you so much for coming in my pleasure thank you